I've already posted a preview of the Fuji X-H1, dealing with the most interesting features, which include some video and still samples. In this video, I'll help you compare the X-H1 to the X-T2, particularly if you're thinking about upgrading. And spoiler alert, this is an upgrade that particularly if you're shooting video with the X-T2, you will want to make. Now, I've prepared this video in the few days I was able to have the X-H1 prior to Fujifilm Canada's official launch events. A more detailed review will follow when I receive a unit for a longer time and can spend the time I need. For this comparison, I'll do my best to be as detailed as I can. The body is larger in every way. It's a magnesium alloy that's 25% thicker than the X-T2, water and weatherproof, rated down to minus 10. The X-T2 was rated to 5 degrees Celsius. 40 is still the high temperature rating. The nameplate has moved from the front to the back, making it a little more subtle. And I don't see the difference, but Fuji says the X-mount has been upgraded with a stronger fit and better weather sealing. Width goes to 140 millimeters from 135, height to 97 from 91, and the depth is now 85 millimeters from 49. The depth is mostly in the grip, which is large and roomy, lots of clearance to the lens. Weight goes from 507 grams to 673 grams with battery and memory card. Although it's larger, the design and operation of the car door has not changed, both slots support UHS-2. The left side ports are the same. On the X-H1, a screw mount to connect the supplied cable holder. The shutter on-off button has been redesigned. The X-H1 can't accommodate a cable release, but on-off has a slightly larger throw, and the forward slanted shutter button, which is larger and better sized for my index finger, also operates in a smoother way. The X-T2's exposure compensation dial has been replaced by a button. I think it's awkwardly placed, but I'll have to see after using it for a while. In place of the exposure compensation dial, a display panel, card and battery status while off, along with the exposure compensation setting. When on, shooting settings. In video mode, there are video specific displays both on and off, and there's a button to light it up in the dark. It's also hugely customizable. You'll see when we get to the setup menu. The ISO dial has been reduced from seven rows of knurling to five. The drive collar has a new continuous M mode and the multi-exposure position has been removed. The shutter dial is also two rows shorter, but the meter collar is the same. The joystick is the same as is the control pad with the four surrounding selector buttons. The remainder of the buttons on the back are larger, rounded, and protrude more. The position is roughly the same, garbage and review top left, AEL, AFL, renamed AFON on the right. The AFON is now to the left of the rear dial. There's an even larger free area and a better thumb rest on the back, and the Q menu has moved to the right of the thumb rest. The front configuration remains the same going clockwise, the flash sync terminal, focus switch, lens release, function button, and the AF assist lamp. The viewfinder goes from the X-T2's 2360 K-dot OLED to 3690 K-dots on the X-H1. It's also brighter, and the eye cup is larger and deeper. Same diopter adjustment range, same view mode switch, same options, same LCD with the same tilt options. But the X-H1 has a touch screen for touch shooting, touch focus, and touch focus area selection. Same 126S battery. The bottom plate of the X-T2 already provided lots of space for a quick release. And there's even more on the X-H1, but that's even less of an issue when the battery grip is connected. The X-H1 has a new battery grip to accommodate the larger size, but the design and layout are nearly identical. The largest difference is the grip extension on the X-T2 battery grip, which isn't needed on the X-H1. On top, the Q button has been moved, the fun button has been replaced by an exposure compensation button, and the forward-leaning on-off shutter button combination mirrors the cameras. 
Compared to the X-T2, the X-H1's mechanical shutter sound is quiet and subtle. But hold on, there are several new shutter options too. We'll find those in the menus. And in general, the screens, the look, the layout and design of the shooting display, the Q menu and the main menu remain unchanged. Menu controls are the same. The touch screen on the X-H1 means you can navigate the Q menu with touch, not the main menu. The menu still usually returns to the first line of the first screen with no option to select return to previous setting. And in the interest of saving time, I'm only going to mention things that are new or missing on the X-H1 and highlight features that have changed. For reference, as there is some context-sensitive behavior, the drive mode is at S. When you turn on the X-H1 for the first time, it wants to connect to your smartphone, which it enables using Bluetooth. This configuration then simplifies the connection to the phone and uses the phone to set the time. The X-H1 has a new film simulation, Eterna. According to Fuji, it emulates cinema film with subdued color and rich shadow detail. The X-H1 has a D-range priority setting, off, weak, strong, and auto. This is going to require some testing, which I will do in my review of the X-H1. The manual, which is somewhat oblique on this item, suggests that this introduces a moderating influence on high contrast scenes. Note that selecting this disables the dynamic range setting, and it's not available with auto ISO. White balance hasn't changed, but the shift adjustment has new indicators to show how to make adjustments. The focus area and modes are the same, and in the review, I'll check on Fuji's claims that focus is faster. The peaking selections have increased, and now include yellow. The touchscreen options enable shooting, focus only, and area selection. These selections can also be made on screen. In drive settings, although there is a new continuous M mode, it doesn't have a selection like high and low. The self timer with high burst Easter egg remains, it takes five shots. Shutter options have expanded, now including control of the front curtain, but they're not straightforward selections. The highest mechanical shutter remains at 8,000, electronic at 32,000. Flicker reduction is new. It delays the shutter when a fluorescent flicker is detected, waiting until the brightest millisecond to snap, although I couldn't figure out how to enable it. The X-T2 supported stabilization only with stabilized lenses. The X-H1 has five axis in body stabilization. It can be set to always on or only while shooting, which means when the shutter button is depressed. In a quick test, I was able to get half second handhelds. I'll do more in the full review. Multi-exposure has moved from the drive caller to the menu, but otherwise works the same. Superficially, the flash menu remains identical, but I don't have enough flash equipment to verify. Now, the video settings, where things are dramatically different. It now ranges over four screens. And note that the video settings can be adjusted while in the stills mode, but the still settings can't be changed when the drive mode is on video. That will make sense in a minute. Video mode settings using a three column selector include 4K at both 17x9 cinema and 16x9 UHD TV resolutions. UHD from 24 to 30 frames, cinema at 24 with non and drop frame versions, 1080 HD also with both aspect ratios and frame rates up to 60. 4K data rates up to 200 megabits, 1080 up to 100. A new high-speed 1080 HD menu enables silent shooting at 120 and 100 frames, recorded at 24 frames for 5 times, 30 for 4 times, and 60 for 2 times. Film simulations for video, like stills, include Eterna, and Fuji provides downloadable LUTs for Eterna and F-Log. Both work nicely. Note that film simulation and many of the following settings are video specific, so you can have a video sim, dynamic range, white balance, etc. independent of the still settings. 
Note that Fuji advises a dynamic range setting of 400% for Eterna, promising a 12-stop range. I'll put that on a xylochart in the review. A custom white balance can be captured in video mode, and all of the color profile parameters are independently set for video. F-Log has been freed from the HDMI menu, so can now be recorded internally. Focus area can be specified for video, and custom settings for autofocus tracking. Sensitivity in 5 steps, speed in 11 steps. Independent face and eye detection, but I think only face works here. Independent MF Assist doesn't include split image, and a new video focus check goes to expanded view as soon as the focus ring is turned in manual focus mode. HDMI output for 4K. When recording 4K internally, only 1080 is output, or vice versa, and an output only option. For HD, both, or external only. In standby, output can be 4K or 1080. Audio control is much improved. It's set in decibels, with independent settings for the internal and external mics, a very useful feature in my book. The limiter can be disabled, and the headphone volume is set here, where it's most useful. An extensive selection of timecode settings for both internal and external recordings. Several tally light options, solid or flashing, with both front and rear lights. Movie Silent Control disables and locks all clicky controls, so the audio won't be affected. On the Setup menu, there are a few new options available for My Menu, like Derange Priority, Touchscreen Mode, Flicker Reduction, and the four pages of Movie Settings. Format has not been added. Headphone volume is no longer on the Sound Setting menu. EVF Color Fine Tuning has been added with two dimensions, the same options are also available for the LCD. Preview Pick Effect has been renamed Natural Live View, and what was off in Preview Pick Effect is now on. To support the new Fujinon MKX cinema lenses, aperture can be displayed in F or T stops. The display custom settings on the X-H1 include touchscreen mode and image transfer order. The sub-monitor, the small screen on top, can be customized for both stills and video modes. Like the display, everything can be changed, including the color of the display, black or white. The function screen customizations include new options, generated by swiping across the screen in four directions. And the front and rear command dial setting has a variety of new options. The operation of the focus ring can be linear, which I think is the new setting, and nonlinear. There is a control to manage the exposure compensation button. Either press and turn or press to activate, press again to deactivate. The aperture ring A position can now be auto or transfer control to the command dial. The touch screen can be completely disabled and the touchpad area, used to select the focus area when shooting with the viewfinder, is configured here. In Save Data Options, Switch Slot Sequential is now available for both still and video. Does that mean the video will start recording on the second slot when the first fills up? Still no backup recording option for video. Connection settings now include options for Bluetooth, where images can be automatically tagged for transfer. General settings is the new home for resize image and geotagging. Information now includes both the Mac and Bluetooth addresses, and there's a wireless setting reset. In playback, the RAW conversion now includes size and quality, as well as D-range priority. A simultaneous delete removes both RAW and JPEG files. The wireless transfer order can be reset, and DISP aspect adjusts the aspect ratio for HDMI playback. Finding differences is hard. I didn't even notice that there were seven knurled rings instead of five until after I had shot my macro close-ups. And stills did get a few tweaks, but the majority of the X-H1's goodness was devoted to video. So why not the X-V1? Is there more to come? I hope this helps. 
shoot until your memory card is full and your battery is empty. I do reply to all relevant questions and civil comments. And I can't wait to get this camera back in my hands to do a full and detailed review.